Welcome to Make Things That Matter, the podcast where we explore impactful products and the cultures that create them. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and if I'm doing my job well, each episode of this show will help you to do meaningful work, make things that make things better, and have a great experience doing it. My guest in this conversation is Martina Hodges-Shell. Martina is a transformation coach and consultant that helps organizations worldwide adopt a Silicon Valley approach to innovation. Prior to that, she spent 25 years leading design and innovation in tech companies. And now what she loves doing is providing a fresh outside perspective to help teams develop and mature their product practice. In this conversation, we define transformation and what it means for your company's operating model. We explore how a company operating model might actually be shifted by adapting AI technology and take that as an example case to walk through these ideas and make them a little more concrete. And finally, we discuss how embodied leadership practices, such as equine coaching, can actually give leaders the most honest feedback they may ever get. Please enjoy Martina. Martina, welcome to the show. It is so great to officially have you here. We've had so many wonderful conversations. I am delighted to finally bring you to the ears of our listeners. How are you doing today? Thank you, Andrew. I'm uh, really excited to be here with you today. I'm doing great. I have a cold. I hope uh, your listeners will uh, accept my apologies for the raspy voice. But I'm really excited to finally have this conversation with you. Awesome. Yeah, well, they're, they're a forgiving bunch and you sound great. So not to worry, not to worry. So, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk a lot about leadership. We're going to talk about transformation. That's a big topic in the air right now in our mm -hmm. world. But before we get into the, you know, all of that, I actually thought it'd be fun to, for the listeners to get to know you a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And if I'm recalling correctly from some of our earlier chats, one of the things that you're quite interested in, and I think you do some work with, is horses, and particularly about how that relates to not just doing it personally, but also with some of your clients and helping people develop as leaders. And I think you're the first person I'd ever met who'd said something like that. So I was like, tell me more. What is that about? Absolutely. It's it's quite, it sounds quite uh, ephemeral and quite quirky. Um, I, a few years ago, got introduced to the concept of equine-assisted coaching. Um, more people have come across this sort of concept around equine-assisted therapy, especially with younger people. Um, this is mm -hmm. adjacent. It's uh, for um, uh, for coaching, uh, for coaching context. It's uh, just consider it a coaching session, a coaching conversation co-facilitated by me, your coach. Coach and uh, mm. and a horse, and you're on the ground in in a safe space in a in a round pen with a horse, having an interaction around a coaching question, and then we're and then we're um, having some uh, coaching conversation around that uh, uh, experience. Okay, this is fascinating. So walk walk me through an example of this. So if I if I came to you, if we were having, if I was you know your coachee, and I was struggling with something, let's say I was struggling with. Uh, what am I hearing from a lot of people lately? Uh, decisions about where they're going with the future of their business, right? Like the world is changing rapidly, a lot of AI stuff happening. We'll come back to that later, put a pin in that. But, uh, you know, it's lots of big questions floating out there about where people take their organization, uh, whether they're just speaking about a product or within a company or an overall company if they're a CEO. So let's say that was the context and I came to you with that yeah. question. What would this actually look like? like what, would we, what would we do? Absolutely. So we might have a coaching conversation around, um, I would start with unpicking your intention around, you know, which direction, but perhaps it's a question around decision making or, or what's the underlying sort of uh, challenge that you're seeing there? Is it sort of working with ambiguity? Is it working with, you know, uh, figuring out how to make better decisions, we will anchor one of those questions in and figure out, okay, you know, what would we like to be a little bit different? And uh, mm. with that question in mind, you would go and have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with, with a horse and okay. um, you might want to do something with them, like send them to sort of walk in one direction or try in another, or uh, you want them to- and Am I on the horse or am I like walking oh. it by the reins? You're, you're, uh, actually the horse is at liberty. That means no reins, no nothing. So the horse is, uh, oh, okay. uh, in a, in a paddock, uh, in a sort of okay. uh -huh. space. Um, uh, you're in that space with them so you can interact on the ground. So no riding, 
no prior um, uh, mm, okay. experience with horses necessary. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for people who are super frightened of horses. That might be really overwhelming, but you know, we could do something. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if you're if you're open and comfortable to to uh, share a space with a horse, these are obviously uh, very well mannered and um, and well trained horses as a safe space to to then interact with them. So the, uh, to try and explore, okay decision making perhaps you know what comes up for you how you're trying to communicate with the horse um mm. and with um you know I, i'll observe that for a while we'll come to, back together to have a conversation around what are you noticing uh in your interaction you know uh in relation to that topic um something will come up something always comes up you know uh, and often it's tapping into you know, a behavior pattern you're noticing about yourself or um, a certain sort of belief uh, that uh, any, any kind of thoughts that might uh, might be a pattern that you're recognizing and how you're how you're interacting with this topic in mind in the space with the animal. And the interesting hmm. thing here is because you can't talk to the horse, right? We can have a conversation yeah. with words, you know, we can rationalize our uh, communication. I can tell you a great deal about my decision making and where I'm taking my business and I'm really excited and confident about it. Mm -hmm. But the feedback you're getting from the horse is very much on how you show up, you know, how congruent you are with, you know, how you're uh, behaving, how you're communicating. The clarity of that, um, they're very good at sensing um, um and mirroring what you're sending out. So essentially, mm -hmm. it's, um, you're getting unfiltered feedback because the horse ha doesn't tell stories. The horse isn't political, yep. you know, not like, not like a colleague in the It's not field. buying my line of BS. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I often like to say horses are great bullshit barometers, <laughs> you know. Yep, yep. Literally <laughs> giving you unfiltered uh, real feedback on how you're showing up right now. And that might be incongruent with how you think you're showing up, how you think you're dealing with a situation. And um, and those are really interesting uh, coaching conversations, you know, where mm. else does that show up? How is that influencing perhaps the decision making or the, you know, the direction of the organization? Are you, you know, um, we will unravel sort of the, the, the sort of underlying concerns and questions that you have around that. And uh, like in any normal coaching conversation, trying to figure out, OK, what might we want to do a little bit differently um, uh, coming to coming to some actionable sort of uh, um, outcomes that you're taking away with you from that session as well. Um, what I also really like is it's not just, you know, getting feedback on how what you do, but also safe space to try something different. You know, how does something mm. different look? You know, what what feedback are you getting from the horse if you try it in a different way? Communicating might be one thing, you know, is it clear? Is it uh, calm and collected? Is it um, sort of um, uh, Decision making to me feels very much like a, you know, how do am I dealing with ambiguity? That that's what comes up for me, you know, as we we're just talking about that topic. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the horse will not give you uh, hard business advice, right? It's not going to sit down and go, <laughs> oh, man. Hey, and here is your opportunity solution tree, or you know, uh, whatever else. Uh, whatever I was else. really hoping that it would be like a Mister Ed situation where the horse <laughs> just gives me the answer. That would be that would have been so nice. <laughs> Absolutely, but what it does give you is an incredible opportunity to you know actually get some you know get some real time feedback on you know how mm -hmm. you show up, which I think is very yeah. rare. It's also outside yeah. of the office. It's not in that, you know, we're rationalizing with words what we're doing and um, uh, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. great deal about what we do, but also really tapping into, oh, what are these underlying things? What are these, you know, here is here is a pattern that I find really sort of uh, a recurring pattern that's coming up for me. Maybe it's a limiting belief. Maybe it's something, you know, so, something where I stumble uh, in other sort of contexts as well. That kind of stuff tends to come up relatively quickly, much more quickly mm. than say, in a normal coaching conversation that I have with people sort of mm -hmm. you know, face to face, voice to voice, uh, human to human. Yeah. And, um, and with that, often really transformational sort of change happens quite quickly because people tap mm. into these kind of noticing things about themselves that they otherwise might mm -hmm. have not noticed. Yeah, no, that makes all the sense in the world. And, you know, 
I love that where you ended that with the topic of transformational change, because that is kind of, you're, you're sort of speaking about an individual level of transformation, yeah. which mm -hmm. when I think about that is sort of a precursor to a larger organizational transformation, right? I, I don't remember who, who it was I read uh, when I was doing a bunch of research on this recently, but it was this idea that, you know, the, the journey of transforming an organization starts within, right? So mm -hmm. it's sort of an inside out journey, but I don't know that that's how it's usually talked about. Is that, how do you frame it for people? Actually, I, I agree. Uh, I find this notion about you need to change yourself before you can change everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really true for me. Um, it's also, um, actually, it, it just reminds me of a pattern I see with a lot of people I work with, with a lot of organizations and teams I work with. Mm -hmm. It's often mm -hmm. the instigators of the transformation of the change, often a senior leader, uh, always feels like, Everybody else needs to change, but I'm golden. You know, I already, you know, I already, I'm forward thinking, you know, I'm already mm -hmm, you know, in mm -hmm. that future space. So I don't need to change at all. It's just everybody else who needs to change. Yeah. And without fail, um, it's, it's often that behavior that's actually holding a transformation back in the organization. Oh, I want to zoom in on that. So let's mm -hmm. let's talk about that because one of one of my big uh, operating beliefs oh. as of now of everything I've learned and seen with with transformations uh, and starting with the leadership. I think we were speaking about this before we hit record, yeah. but this idea that the leaders have to be personally involved with the change, mm -hmm. right? They have to. Um, you can't just you can't outsource this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this is all, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, but this is all uh, timely given Marty Kagan's new book, Transformed, uh, came out, I think, about a month ago. So there's a lot of this going on. I'm sure we'll get more into that. But say a little more for me about yeah. that, because what you just described, that pattern of you know this forward-thinking leader, and mm -hmm. maybe they really are, right? They are thinking about the future mm -hmm. probably much more than you know your average middle manager who's consumed with execution of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, so, But what is it that they have to change? Because... It does seem like there is value that they are mentally already in the future. So, so tell, say more about that for me. Like, unpack that. Absolutely, and I mean, as you, as you might uh, imagine, it's very individual for each person, like what that change might look like. But um, right. almost always, they also still have patterns or behaviors or you know mindsets, uh, mm. sort of. Um, areas of their mindset that is still in that space that they're currently operating in, in the space that, um, that, um, they've been successful in so far. Right. And, um, then the question is how can that person also together with everybody else, uh, do a full, um, uh, mindset shift, do a full, um, changing how they show up as a leader in this, uh, in this organization to, um, to be the leader of the future state that, the, that the team needs to help them succeed. And quite mm. often it's something around the letting go of decision making and, and that mm. directionality being more okay. the supporting, the, uh, sort of the coaching leader, you know, uh, rather than the directing leader. Um, because, Quite often, you know, that's what's, uh, that's what's got you into senior leadership role in the, uh, over the last, you know, uh, decades and, uh, got mm -hmm. you, yeah, got you, uh, supported, got, got you successful so far. So there's, there's usually something still that needs to shift and change as, as we're moving into a different way of, like for everybody into a different way of working, because otherwise they often wouldn't be in this, you know, they're also working in this space right now. So it sounds like the the change you're describing that this leader has to undergo isn't necessarily, you know, hey, stop thinking about the future and think about the present, but rather mm -hmm. more of um, a mindset, a way of showing up, like how they're being with with mm -hmm. people through this process. Um, and it sounds like that's where there is perhaps some letting go of control, right? Which is scary for leaders because mm -hmm. you know it's what's the what's the famous saying? Uh, what, what got you here won't get you there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is control, is that like the main place that this really hits on or are there other, what are the big themes? Um, to me, that's one of the main themes because uh, I mean, I guess control can be equated with power, right? So if, if you're also, if you're on the hook for delivering, if, if it's your uh, right. responsibility to deliver on something, it's only natural that you actually want to take an active part in making sure that, that we're going to be successful. But yep. um, what I find yeah, quite often that is just um, not necessarily the best way to uh, to set um, to set teams up for 
outcomes driven and power of teamwork you know mm-hmm. like the team mm-hmm. the solution uh, uh with, mm-hmm. within the parameters of of uh leadership uh, goal setting but uh, yeah I, I often see that as the sort of main sticking point um mm. but of course other other leadership in the organization often needs to you know needs to do a lot more uh, changing in in that respect than than perhaps the person who's instigating all this uh all this change and transformation but they're also currently operating in this space usually uh they're hardly yep. ever just brought in to create this change and they and they're working in a uh, in a you know I was going to say vacuum, that sounds wrong, but, you know, on a blank sheet of paper, um, they're also yeah. in this current state uh, of the of the organization. Yeah, you know, as you're saying that, it reminds me of, um, of two things. The first one is, you know, the thing you were saying about the leader who's often, you know, they are in the future, in their mind, right, mm-hmm. is this idea, and I think this comes from, I think this comes from John Cotter's work on change management and leading change, mm-hmm. was this idea that, um the change is unevenly distributed without within an organization. So the idea is by the time you get to like initiating a transformation, the senior leaders have already, they've, they've been there mentally for a while. And so this is normal to them, but it's like brand new to everybody else. And so Mm -hmm. there's going to be this, you know, for them, it's like obvious at this point because they're forgetting all the mental processes they had to go through to get where they are now, but it's going to be a shock to everybody else to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of, like the way the change propagates through an organization seems seems related to what you're pointing at. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like, you know, the future is already here, but unevenly distributed. Uh, yep. And um, yes, and I think sometimes there I see that just that impatience of senior leaders. Mm. Right? Well, for us, this has been crystal clear for such a long time. Why haven't you, you know, why hasn't the rest of their organization sort of uh, followed suit? Why, why yep. aren't they yet? Why haven't we finished transforming? When, when, when we're barely at the starting point of, uh, you know, mm-hmm. of transitioning from A to B, um, absolutely true. There's there's that sort of impatience and living in the future as well, can also create an interesting dynamic and challenge for, yeah, just just making room and space for. It takes time to move a number of people, f- uh, or you know, to to get a group of people from doing things one way to doing something different, especially mm-hmm. cultural change, mindset shift, uh, sort of thrown into the mix. Yeah. I remember many months ago, I was having some chats with different folks I know who specialize in change management. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, I'm starting to do a lot more transformation work. I know I need to understand just the change process itself, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it's it's a, a major component of doing a transformation, although it's like, it's not, you know, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Let's call it that. And I was like, well, who, you know, who do I, what do I really need to understand? Who do I really need to read to like make sure I'm, I'm not sending a client down like a really bad trajectory or something? And one of the ones that came back really consistently was um, uh, the book Managing Transitions by mm-hmm. William Bridges. And are you familiar mm-hmm. with the, the Bridges model? I have not uh, been using that. I should I should read up on that more. Okay, check check this one out. So what what I love about this model, uh, actually, it's also really great for personal change. Mm. So they have a book called Just Transitions. That's all about like transitions in life, right? Like all the stuff that we go through as humans uh, as we move through our lives. And the thing, just to, you can boil actually the whole model down of just the transition model to something very simple, which is actually that it um, it starts with an ending. Mm-hmm. That's actually like the, the 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 hook for the model. Basically, is it doesn't start with a start; it starts with an ending. Mm-hmm. And so there is always loss mm-hmm. involved in a transition of any kind, and that I feel like is something that we just, at least in in Western culture, is almost constantly overlooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm really curious, like, how do you see that showing up either with the leaders you work with or within the organizations where you know I imagine with the kind of changes we're talking about here even if they're good, right? These are good for the org. It's going to be good for people's careers. There's probably, I'm assuming, like a lot of loss or, or fear. Um, what do you see? And and also, how do you how do you help people with that? It's true. Uh, and yes, and I think this goes straight to the, you know, I, I know the very well-known adage of, you know, change is hard and people don't like change. Uh, and I think they don't like change because it really is a, is a loss. It is an ending of something comfortable, there's something familiar, something that they know well. And then we're mm-hmm. asked to do something unfamiliar, something different, mm-hmm. uh, something that they perhaps don't feel uh, confident about yet, or, 
you know, they were an expert at something else. We're asking them to sort of begin to do something different. Uh, I'm not surprised at all that people feel uncomfortable about being asked yeah. to change, um, especially, um, you know, we're asking a whole organization to change. There's a lot of people there who didn't ask for change. They were doing just fine or mm-hmm. they had their own <laughs> ideas about how things could improve. And it's not as if, uh, you know, I ever work with a team or an organization where, you know, there aren't a lot of amazing ideas already happening about we could be doing this, but, you know, this is really a thoughtful, um, sort of organized way of, um, um, yeah, a systems view way of bringing all of these sort of things together, thinking them through, mm-hmm. you know, so they fit together well, and then moving towards mm-hmm. that. So I guess I'm helping with that, uh, trying to catch uh, people's uh, good ideas and good intentions and aspirations. But um, you, you will, I don't believe you will ever find an organization where everyone's ready to just let go of what they're doing right now and, and mm-hmm. try something different. I think all about, you know, even just being aware of that, acknowledging that and picking everyone up where they're at right now. You know, right. the, the people who are really leaning into this and excited about it, get them to participate. The people who are really uncomfortable about it, you know, design um, sort of um, mm-hmm. uh, interactions, design a path from A to B, you know, that that sort of helps support that. I think that's where your change management comes back in. To me, that's a, you know, how do we get from A to B and bring people along the way uh, so they don't, you know, so mm-hmm. they drop off or disengage along the way. But um, to me, it often doesn't look at, well, usually doesn't look at the content of what we're actually changing rather than how yeah. to change it, right? So I think those yeah, two things absolutely. Are pretty well. Um, but yes, always see people who are who are worried about change. And I think it's very normal. Um, yeah. But, yeah, they didn't ask for it usually. <laughs> Yeah, there's always somebody who's like, why did you mess up my nice life? Exactly. That was fine. That was great. I was doing great. Yeah, things were awesome. Thanks. Um, (laughs) Yep, always a thing. So I love that you just brought what you just touched on there, because I feel like there's, you know, when we're considering a transformation, Mm. there's so many layers that Mm. are at play in in parallel, right? There's processes, there's business models, there's the human side of change, mm-hmm. like fear, loss, change, everything we're saying yeah. here. Um, and then, you know, maybe one way of speaking a little more of the content of the change, I think is the word that we like to use is an operating model. And so, you know, I, actually, let's take a step back really quick and let's talk about, um, I would love to hear how you frame it for people in terms of like, okay, we're talking about this quote unquote transformation thing, right? And we can call that a, a digital transformation. We could mm-hmm. call that a product model transformation. There's kind of a, a lot of buzzwords out there, but they all roughly pointing in the same direction. How do you frame that for people? If somebody's like, hey, Martino, like, what does it mean to transform? And, and what is what is this operating model you talk? Like, what do you mean by operating model? No, absolutely. I think it's a great question because I... Um, I also, it's it's hard to just put one word to it, and I'll explain that because you'll very quickly mm. get really hard eye rolls. You know, it's agile transformation, or it's digital transformation, or it's product <laughs> uh, you know, product led transformation, or we're mm-hmm. going to have a, a human centered uh, you know um, organization. We're going to be. I can, I, can, I can feel the eye rolls already. <laughs> Absolutely right. I I can hear them quite quite loudly, yep. and I find it really hard to also just put one label on it because I think all of these words are. So so loaded these days. People have gone through so many experiences of attempted change as well that hasn't gone very well. So there's all this mm. sort of built up, oh goodness, we've been there, we've tried that. It was awful, you know, uh, so mm-hmm. much collected, mm-hmm. um, um, uh, yeah, bad experiences, you know. Um, sure. How, yeah, so I find it also hard to, to have a label on this. I was listening to Marty's, uh, uh, a couple of his um podcast lately as as his new book has come out and i realized i'm just uh i'm repeating what he said there it's like for the longest time i have tried to not put a label on it at all uh but it right. is, you know um transformation towards you know uh lean agile user-centered uh product uh oriented but of course products and services there's so many caveats to build on this one you know one spiffy mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. phrase, but is yeah. How do we, in a modern way, deliver value and uh, and innovate, um, deliver value to our customers? And I think on the one hand, that's how, what we want to transform to to be great at that, right? To align ourselves on that and our organizations, but also for me, an operating model is 
how are we coming together to deliver value to our customers? Obviously, again, there needs to be a caveat, just like the it depends answer. There's always just another thing. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, deliver value to the customer. That makes sense to the business, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that definition. So when when inside that context, this idea yeah. that at least the way I think of it, my my current way of explaining this for people is that uh, it's sort of the difference between efficiency and growth, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, like two of the terms that get I think really confused a lot, especially if you're someone who's just like popping the hood on this whole like digital transformation, mm-hmm. you know, can of worms you see these terms get used interchangeably a lot like digitalization or digitization or digital transformation and, or, you know, and probably 15 others. And yeah. the way I usually boil it down for people is like, well, really what we're talking about that makes it kind of a true transformation is a change in ultimately the business model of the organization, mm-hmm. right? So how do we create, deliver and, and capture value, which, you know, often boils down to like, a new value prop or a better value prop that changes mm. how we serve customers. Is that Does that match what you see? So there are four lenses I'm thinking uh, about when I'm thinking about operating model, how are we coming together to deliver value? And that's through the structure, you know, how we organize to collaborate, mm. then the mm-hmm. ways of working, you know, uh, what do we do to actually uh, create uh, customer experience, uh, products, services, et cetera? Um, what is the mindset? What are the values that we, uh, we have as an organization? Then... Um, uh, then also the capabilities, you know, what, what capabilities do we actually need? We often have, um, you know, titles that all sound very similar, but certain capabilities are not, uh, uh, not yet present in the organization that we need to develop, um, that are really critical for us. And alongside of the ways of working, also the, decision making, you know, um, dare I say governance, but how do we know that we're, you know, deciding to work on the most valuable thing? You know, how do we prioritize? How do we know that we're making progress? How do we know that as we're bringing all of these things together, it's all laddering up towards our Mm -hmm. organizational, um, um, strategy and vision. So those, those things in terms of, um, operating model, but then, uh, we're also talking about business model. I think, and they're a huge opportunity for organizations to reinvent themselves and, and really, uh, innovate on how do we actually make money? What do we, what do we sell mm-hmm. to our customers? You know, what, what value are we actually, deli- uh, what value are we creating in what way? And there are lots of new, uh, and interesting ways to do that. And I'm thinking especially AI as the latest sort of trend in all these new ah, technologies. I was wondering if we get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sure you're seeing this too. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, most of my most of my clients are scratching their heads trying to figure out, you know, how do we how do we make the most of uh, you know, embracing AI? What does that mean for our organization? How do we bring it uh, into the fold? Uh, how do we bring mm-hmm. it into the company? From my perspective, how do you do it well? So, you know, you're actually maximizing the value you're getting from that rather than bolting another practice, another uh, function on that is poorly integrated and, and mm-hmm. uh, languishing in the system. And, um, and then, of course, what do you do with the products as well, right? What, what actually makes sense from an AI perspective and you as a business? Uh, how can that add value? So, lot- yeah. Lots okay. to begin, as always. Yes, lots, lots there. So let me just pause for a second and make sure, just make sure I'm with you here. So we're talking about transformation as, as sort of ultimately changing how you serve customers, right? Mm-hmm. Which which shows up in value props and in business models, and then it, how that happens seems like it's through a change. You know, ultimately it's a change in your operating model, yeah. and mm-hmm. the way you were laying that out was that it was kind of, I think, loosely speaking, four parts, and I think mm-hmm. you said structure ways of working, uh, capabilities, and then decision-making. Was that Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So now that we have that, we've got a nice foundation here for anyone who's with us. So let's actually, if it's interesting to you, what if we, let's like, let's apply this inside the, the, the AI-ification of business right now, because that's, you know, that's the hot thing right now that on, that's on every, you know, every CEO in the world is getting asked about this by their board. So this is probably <laughs> yeah. quite timely for people. So let's, let's actually, why don't we zoom in on that? If that sounds interesting to you, I'd love to kind of use that structure you laid out around the operating mm-hmm. model and maybe explore what would it look like to, uh, you know, transform taking advantage of this new enabling technology with generative AI 
and maybe play that out just to kind of make it really concrete for people. How does that, does that sound okay to you? That sounds great. Let's, let's uh, think that through on the fly. I haven't prepped that. Yeah. Um, yes. So let's start with structure. Uh, first question, of course. And um, let me just step back before we dive in. Let's assume it's more than just using chat GPT to, you know, just um, to, um, to enhance your productivity. Um, so the mm-hmm. question is, you know, how can we get ourselves some AI capability um, into our organization? And my first question then would be, okay, structurally, if you're bringing uh, data scientists, uh, um, AI, AI people into your organization, how many do you need for your ambitions? Um, who, mm-hmm. Where do they sit? Um, mm-hmm. How does that impact um, their ability to influence organizational uh, strategy, but also delivery? You know, in terms of um, if they're not invited in, at the right level to to participate in feeding into what is our direction? What are we prioritizing? What are we, you know, what are the most important, most valuable things we could be working on? Um, mm-hmm. Need to be able to influence that as much as do we have critical mass to actually create um, what uh, what we're, um, you know, uh, the the capability we're thinking of that. Um, who are those people? Where do they sit? You know, um, often I see, you know, put on uh, sort of parts of the organization that, that have a hard time collaborating well with others because they're kind of siloed somewhere. So here's a real opportunity to think through who, who, where, you know, how do we make sure they're fully integrated so we can get full value out of this new practice that we're introducing to the organization? Uh, okay, so so we're we're in this first bucket of structure, and and as you as you step through these 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 mm-hmm. buckets, are there um <clears throat> are there common patterns that uh you know so let's say we're considering this AI change, mm-hmm. are there common patterns of oh mm, don't do that that's that's probably not going to work or this seems to work like do you, do you see those sorts of uh, pa- patterns within within each part of the operating model? Uh, less so, you know, drawing you a few, and here is how you should structure your organization. I think that's quite contextual to each organization. Mm. I think there's patterns in that too. But I'm thinking more of the, you know, don't silo the team, you know, somewhere to the sidelines. Make sure they mm. are, um, you know, structurally somewhere where they can also, um, they have the same voice as the other practices in developing um, in, you know, discovering new opportunities and developing, uh, product. How do you make sure they're, um, they're in a place where they can work, um, without, um, without barriers with everybody else? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. also thinking about, um, you know, just as you structure that, you know, any structuring decision, uh, is inadvertently a decision on, you know, um, how easy it is for, for that person to, to, work with others, to communicate with others, to be seen, right? And, and it's hard in the abstract to talk about, you know, it would be really great to organize it this way um, versus that way. But I feel often just at the very rud- rudimentary uh, uh, level, I see teams that are not well integrated at all. Mm. And, and by integrated, do you mean integrated with the the rest of the organization in a, like sort of in a cross-functional way? Yes. Thank you for the question. Because to me, it seems so, so obvious. I I'm not even spelling it out. Yes. So uh, it's, so they can be part of a cross-functional team quite easily. There isn't ah. necessarily a barrier between this group and others. Um, I've seen uh, teams where, you know, there was a complicated communication system to request whether we can have a resource to possibly mm-hmm. answer some things. So weeks of email chain or other, com- you know, Um, lots of barriers that the organization sort of puts between people. And from my perspective, this works really well if you bring AI into your org, if it's part of your, if it's part of your cross-functional product team, right? You want to solve problems Mm -hmm. together, you want to Mm -hmm. identify opportunities together. Um, And to me, that's super, you know, I think that's where you get most value out of, uh, out of your new AI practice. Okay, I love it, and and also for the listener, um, I'm going to reference uh, a couple short, two short episodes that I that came out at the end of last year with a guest named Chris Smith that mm-hmm. were specifically about 
uh, AI, specifically, how do you how do you bring AI into your organization and think through those decisions, especially as a leader, if you're thinking about like budgeting, for example. So we'll link to all that in the show notes. But That's I just wanted to amazing. call that out since we're on, since we're on topic. Um, I love it. I'm looking forward to uh, reading up on that as well. Actually, um, uh, Noel Saldana and I, a good friend of mine who's uh, who's also mm-hmm. data scientist, we've just uh, written. Uh, a bunch of blog posts that address uh, this in more detail as well. So, oh, wonderful! Uh, Please, yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. If you send me the links afterwards, we'll we'll definitely include that in the show notes for folks. Brilliant, uh, fantastic. So let's move on. So we we had we sort of hit pillar one, which is structure. Yeah. Let's move on to number two. So we're talking about AIifying our company. What does this mean? So we talked about structurally. We want to get make sure we've got those people, you know, account mm-hmm. for where they are, integrate them in a cross functional manner. But yeah. talk to me about ways of working. Like, what does that what does that actually mean? Absolutely. From my perspective, again, you know, what does this new practice need to actually um, uh, work at its full potential? How do you set them up for success and really understand what each practice needs? And in that respect, a- AI team is no different than any other team. I feel most of the time I see one dominant practice um, mm-hmm. and everyone else kind of needing to bend around that and work their way around that. Um, from my perspective, again, I'm very much in favor of a balanced team. It's really peers working together. So figuring out if we're looking at our ways of working today, is there anything that we're doing that would, you know, hinder um, the AI uh, folks to be, you know, do we need to adapt or adjust anything? Is there something in timing or is there something in uh, who does what when? Um uh, mm-hmm. you know, are we bringing them into, you know, too early, too late, et cetera? I can't imagine um, too early. But, you know, there's questions to figure out, you know, what are we doing right now? And is that the best possible way to to enable the uh, these new folks as well? Okay, perfect. That makes a lot of sense. Do you find that, um, I mean, AI is such a, at least, on, you know, it seems like such a disruptive technology and, mm-hmm. and enabling technology um, I can't think of a better example of a technology that can drive changes in your business model, right? Going to the, like, it's Absolutely. almost the perfect case for transformation because it's like, yeah, this is a, a total game changer technology. It's going to, you know, people say change everything and who, who yeah. knows, but uh, what a good example. But do you find that something like this is also going to cut deeper into, that sounds, that sounds much harsher than I meant it. <laughs> like cut deeper sounds kind of, kind of negative, but I mean, is it going to more deeply affect the organization in terms of like mindset or values, for example? I believe so. And I think it's a good question of, again, I hate this. It depends. <laughs> Apologies for that <laughs> right answer. It depends on what hey, we, made it, we made it most of the way through this without a solid. It depends. That's pretty good for uh, something in this topic domain. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I was uh, I was having high hopes. I wouldn't say it at all, but um, it was um, yes. Uh, I believe it fundamentally can change a lot, and I believe it's a great catalyst for innovation. So I think mm. what we're looking at in terms of um, opportunity to innovate, uh, we need to look at how how is the organization set up for innovation uh, practices and mm. capabilities. Mm. I'm thinking. You know, this is very much design process. This is very much uh, sort of product uh, practice as well. You know, how do we bring all these people together and actually make the space for innovation as well? Um, mm-hmm. I work with a lot of organizations where we talk a lot about innovation, but, you know, innovation practices have uh, over the years um, perhaps um waned a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, in favor of uh, moving towards uh, predictable delivery, you know, uh, with stable, Mm -hmm. uh, large products that are successful. Um, Here is the question of how do you go back to actually looking at what what are the real possibilities here? You know, uh, really early sort of um, uh, ideation um, to figure out what could we be doing with this? what mm-hmm. value could we be creating for the organization? And with that, perhaps some really quite drastic change. And as you're saying, business model, you know, different business models, having having the capability and the openness to that, to actually see, you know, embrace that and 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 deliver on that opportunity. I think um, mm-hmm. for a lot of organizations, that's not that's not their comfort zone anymore. 
Yeah. And it, it's funny, you we sort of naturally slid into the third one, which is the capabilities. And, Absolutely. you know, I think when, when people consider something like, like AI, the obvious yeah. thing is like, oh, well, we don't, we don't know how to do that. We don't have yeah. people who know, we don't have that talent right now. That's like the obvious answer. It's like, yeah. okay, fine. So that's, that is one thing, but it sounds like you're actually hinting at something more deeper mm. that it sounds like you're hinting at something deeper than that, which is saying, for example, it's not just that a company may not have, um, people with the, the, the necessary skills at this point, yeah. right. In terms of data science and algorithm design and this sort of thing. Uh, but to your point of many companies, um, have kind of lost their ability to innovate. They've lost that muscle. Uh, of, mm -hmm. of exploring the unknown and innovating in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems like it could be potentially a trigger for having to rebuild that muscle or, or how do you think about that? I, I would highly recommend that because how I see it is otherwise you're just working on, you know, our first best idea, you know, someone had an idea and let's go and make yep. that happen. Um, to me, it feels like you're, um, optimizing in a dead end in a cul-de-sac. It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're looking at a local maximum rather than yep. having a broad perspective on, um, what are all the possibilities and then having a rigorous process to figure out of these possibilities, what actually makes sense for us? What are we able to, to do right now? You were just speaking about capabilities. Where are we at with our own, even, not just the people, but where is our data at? Where is our instrumentation at? What can we actually do with what mm -hmm. we have today mm -hmm. in the near midterm, you know, versus longer term goals that might need a lot of heavy lifting under, underneath as well. Um, and, you know, what makes sense from our brand perspective? What do people trust us to do? I'm reminded of, um, you know, when the app store came out or even just when the internet started and everyone Everyone needed to have that same thing, you know. And I think, you know, I don't want to go to my bank for the next social network. I've certainly been asked many, <laughs> any brand under the sun to go, we need to build a Facebook, you know, quite a few years yeah. ago. When that was the hottest It's, it's thing. like how everything is suddenly a community, right? Like every, yeah. every anything that has more than two humans involved in it is, is suddenly like labeled a community. You're like, um, I don't know if that's, this is not necessarily a community. Exactly. So to me, there's a question of, you know, not just what are the possibilities, but also what can you, you know, there's exciting opportunities, really bold opportunities, but also what is credible for you as, you know, as your brand, as your organization to your customers or perhaps also new audiences. But I think that's also a reality check, you know, as we're, as we're embarking on a sort of as exciting new, you can tell I'm a designer, right? As a <laughs> candy store kind of uh, um, yeah. rats of opportunities here, uh, I think also some uh, reality check on what makes sense for your organization as well. But yeah. I think yeah. really uh, going back to the original point, this is an exciting opportunity. You shouldn't miss it. And you shouldn't just do a me too of uh, copy and paste of somebody else. And you were asking about, you might not have the capabilities right now, but do you really want to be tethered to the capabilities of somebody else? What if that access changes? What if that access ceases? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all of a sudden you don't have that AI capability anymore. So thinking all of those things through and thinking about what investment do you need to make? You know, those are big mm -hmm. changes for an organization for sure. All right, so let's come back to let's come into the fourth the fourth one of this model, which is again flows nicely from what you were just saying, which is decisions, right? How do we decide what to work on? How do we know if it's working and advancing us towards our vision? How do you how do you frame this for people? Because I feel like decision making is one of those it's one of those things that we you know it's so important and everybody knows it's important, but they may not appreciate the scope of the change here, right? It's not just changing how decisions are made at the leadership level. This propagates all the way up and down and across. So how do you how do you help people get their head around this? Absolutely, I'm thinking about how to connect the loop back from the teams, uh, all the interesting things they're discovering, back to mm -hmm. the overall decision of which direction are we going to go in and what um, what is the most valuable thing to work on. I think it would be mm -hmm. remiss not to uh, close that loop. That's usually mm. where I start explaining. You know, all of a sudden, if you're working in this uh, different way, you're going to have a lot more insights about what's valuable, what's uh, what's an unmet need, what could be interesting, and being able to give that back to senior leadership to uh, who are deciding on the overall direction of the organization, uh, what are we going to, you know, what are we going to focus on? Um, 
it would be, from my perspective, it would be tragic if we weren't able to, to, um, all that, uh, bring all that wisdom in. Uh, so that's usually where I start. Um, it's mm, very okay. much looking at from organizational vision and strategy all the way through to, uh, each team member on a collaborative team making day to day decisions. How does that all work together? And, uh, and drawing that out along the, you know, in parallel to the, you know, how do we work together from, you know, from vision to day to day and delivery? Um, here we see what's the decision making that's happening. What's the lightweight and, uh, uh, tuned in, um, uh, reporting back out how we're making progress towards the goals. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, really um mapping all of that out and um as you might expect you know the question around what are sort of what are the um most important uh, most valuable opportunities we're going to work on uh, uh first first um bucket second bucket you know um uh, what um what are the opportunity spaces you know uh, that we're going to give to teams to figure out how to create uh uh uh, the most valuable solution in that. And then how do we best create that solution? What's the best way of delivering that value? Um, and then mapping out, how does that flow? How, how do we communicate, uh, appropriately and, um, and make sure that people don't end up in endless meetings about status reports or spending more time on documenting what they've done and uh, and explaining to other people what they're doing than actually being able to do the work. That makes all the sense in the world. So I want to ask, I have one more question and then we'll start to close out. But I guess my question, just trying to, we've covered so much territory in this conversation yeah. and thank you for sharing all of this. I'm imagining that some listeners might be going, okay, wow, that was a lot. And they're trying to digest all this. So I'm wondering if you, how do you, if you could offer the listener kind of like, hey, here, take all that, but here is where to start, right? Here's maybe a first big milestone to target that Mm -hmm. if they aim for that, they'll, they'll, it'll move them through all these, you know, get them moving in the right directions and move them through maybe the conversations they need to have Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the initial changes they need to make. Obviously, bearing in mind that it's probably a much longer road than this first milestone, but just kind of giving people like a concrete first thing to focus on. How would you, could you frame something up like that? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah. And I think this is independent of whether we're talking about including AI or not. Um, And Mm. uh, you're absolutely right. There's a lot here. And what I would recommend as a starting point, because every organization's starting point, as you might imagine, is can be incredibly different depending on what they're doing right now. Mm. Step one is, uh, just take stock of where you're at today. How is um, all this working together? Sketching this out, not just from your own perspective, but perhaps being able to uh, invite in um, perspectives from other practices so you get a sort of well-rounded sort of overview of uh, today, of your operating model mm-hmm. today. Um, mm-hmm. I have a canvas that helps you with a few prompts um, because there is a lot here. Uh, I think it's it's helpful just to have a couple of questions that help you guide that sort of conversation. To me, that's a starting point because then you can have a look at and where where do we experience real pain today? And again, you might do that for yourself and go, mm, I, I see where that is uh, for me, but perhaps for other practices, that is a completely different topic. And start mm-hmm. there uh, because um, uh, it'll be more contextual than me saying, hey, you should all look at your structure, collaboration structure, or you should all look at your outcome-based thinking or working. Um, I think it's helpful to look at, okay, what are we doing today? Where does it hurt? And what are our goals? Where do we want to get to? Uh, what what are we not able to do today that we would like to be able to do? Mm, I love that. I love that. And we'll definitely link to that canvas in uh, in the show notes. So, well, this is fantastic, Martina. I want to go ahead and start to close out here with a couple of rapid fire questions. They're just fun mm-hmm. ways to bring it home. And um, no right answers. There's just whatever your answers are. <laughs> so we, we just covered the one I was going to ask you, which is like, what would you know, what would the homework be for someone, uh, yeah. for a leader listening to this? So let's, it, it, I'm curious if there's anything else you'd add on there of like, Hey, here's just step one. Here's your homework. What would the starting mm-hmm. point be? Is there anything you'd add on to what you just said? 
Yeah, then the the fun step two homework is, you know, what might the future uh, look like? You know, uh, designing the future state of that with, you know, having that systems view, having that sort of holistic sort of perspective, trying to figure out what could we be doing differently and, you know, uh, and then figure out how do we get there. So that sounds like a lot of homework, but, uh, you know, um, I'm not expecting you to do that by uh, next week with your next uh, um, podcast. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> so uh, just a couple couple of questions here. Uh, one, and these are not really about uh, the topic we've been discussing. They're just sort of more general. So whatever life chapter you consider uh-huh. yourself to be in, if you could go back to the start of this chapter and start again, knowing what you know now, is there any anything you do differently or advice you would give your your younger self? Um, yes. Um, I was looking for uh, succinct answers, easy, easy solutions for people who are all looking for, make it easy for us to transform and change, you know, moving towards this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the realization, that, well, the, the obvious answer is this is just not simple. It's not quick. It's not, uh, you know, silver bullet solution. And, uh, and just be comfortable with that and just be comfortable with being able to say that as well. Uh, when people push on you, going like, but no, seriously, we need a shortcut. <laughs> so basically embrace the complexity of this and, and the fact that it's just hard. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful way of summarizing that. Okay, very good. Very good. So I'm curious, you know, I find that um, the two of the biggest factors, at least in my life, uh, that shape how I think about things, how I explore things are either uh, the people who have influenced me or mm-hmm. and or the questions that sort of get embedded in my mind that I'm, I'm asking myself on an ongoing basis, whether I'm aware of that or not. And so mm-hmm. I'm curious, uh, are there any of those for you? Like, are, are there any particular people who have influenced you or any questions that you find very, very helpful as you as you navigate things? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so I've trained as a designer. So for me, everything I'm doing um, is really applying design process to different questions. Mm-hmm. And um, But organizations, businesses tend to have this kind of visceral sort of uh, reaction to, oh, but design, no, that's not that you know that that's not what we think is the solu- uh, solution to this question uh why mm-hmm. would a designer have an answer to that so it's really curious to me to uh always be coming back to this question of uh how can i yeah bring bring more design practice uh into into organizations and into different questions is there a specific part of the design process you find especially helpful um it's this whole notion about you know um, who is your audience? What problem do they have? Um, what, uh, what solutions do they have right now? Where are the gaps? You know, what could you do to help them achieve their goals? Um, and obviously that needs to be better than what they're doing right now, right? That cost of switching needs to, you know, we need to be able to bridge the gap. And to me, that's the sort of, um, essence of, of everything we do in, uh, you know, product innovation, product development, organizational transformation, uh, solving mm-hmm. non problems with ever changing <laughs> technology. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Is there, uh, I'm curious if there's any, you know, books or resources you, you find yourself repeatedly giving people or pointing people to, uh, that you just find very, very helpful, whether that's for the topics of like transformation and all the things we're talking about, or just in general, like, Hey, this is one of these, life level books that i i think everyone should read mm. um i really enjoy e- escaping the build trap uh from this perry mm-hmm. i uh i mm-hmm. share that with a lot of people um who, who are trying to get their head around you know diff- different way of thinking about stuff there are so many other books there's so many good ones um uh the one you recently recommended to me i'm really enjoying and recommending a lot lately is the Growing groups into teams. I really ah. uh, love that. Uh, just, just the whole premise of uh, people sort of embracing uh, how they set their people up as better teams. Really, really amazing work. Um, so many good books there. I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking. I'm not doing all these amazing authors justice right now. <laughs> There's too many. I, I get it. It's 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 uh, it's a very hard problem because we. I, yeah, I love books too, and I'm constantly recommending books. Yeah, my friends give me give me a hard time about this. They're like, did you? They're like, did you actually just make it through a conversation without making a book reference? I'm like, yeah. 
<laughs> the answer is usually no. Um, hundreds of books stacked here and I'm like i want to recommend all of them quite frankly <laughs> yeah yeah but but great choice there with gr- growing groups into teams that's by uh pam fox rollin and her colleagues mm-hmm. um and also a former guest on the show we'll link to her episode it's it's mm-hmm. a lovely conversation um well okay just in closing out martina first of all thank mm-hmm. you so much for being here for sharing your wisdom and your experience i love your take on all of this uh but just in closing out what would you like to leave the listener with and how can folks be helpful to you Acknowledge the fact that change is a process and it's uh, it's not an overnight thing, no matter how much uh, uh, project success pressure is put on you. It's really not surprising. Kind of, we need to have this done already. Why aren't we finished? And how can this take months? You know, you just need to tell me it's going to be quick. Um, this is a process and it'll take time. And how can how can your listeners be helpful to me? Um, have a look at um, the operating model goals canvas, so OMG canvas. Uh, let me know what I can do uh, to improve it in terms of questions, in terms of prompts. Um, I want to be able to make this really, you know, it's such a broad topic. It's such a deep topic. I want to make it accessible to people. Perfect. All right, Martina. Well, we will link to all of that in the show notes. And thank you so much for what you're doing. Keep it up and we'll see you out there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, I'd be so grateful if you could do me a favor and take about 25 seconds to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That helps me reach way more listeners, and it also helps me bring you more great guests. As always, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at connect at makethingsthatmatter.com. And until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. See you out there.